you have to value the business. And as a follower of Ben Graham, what one piece of Graham's advice would you say has had the most impact on you? Well, you, you can't get rid of one leg of the free leg of the tool and still have a, a good investment philosophy. But uh, I would say that uh, the most important thing uh, over a long period and working with big money uh, is to understand the business. I mean, uh, if, let's just say for the moment that you were given a million dollars for whatever sum was necessary and you could uh, look around Knoxville or look around all of Tennessee if you want and buy into any three businesses you know, between now and a week from now, private businesses. So they not trading or anything of the sort. So you got a week to do it or you have to give the money back. Now, what would you be doing during the next week? I mean, you can look at all these companies, some of them you're quite familiar with, some of them you're less familiar with, some of them you know by reputation, some of them you know the management, some of them you don't. You know their competitive situation. Right? What will you be thinking about during that seven day period? How will you actually be screening these companies out? I think you'll look you're going to be looking for businesses that have enduring competitive advantage. You, know, you don't want to buy a Burger King franchise just because nobody's come within 10 miles of it yet, because you know Wendy's and McDonald's and all of those will be there pretty soon. I mean, it, it, it isn't necessarily who's earning the most money now. It, you, you, you're going to look for something with enduring competitive advantage. Now, that takes a business with some kind of a moat around it, because capitalism by definition, is, is, is a system where every time somebody has an economic castle, somebody else is going to come after it. It's just the nature. If you open a restaurant and it's successful here in town, you know, somebody's going to take your menu, probably take your chef, maybe cut your price, maybe offer a little more parking, maybe be a better, better okay, whatever. I mean, capitalism consists of going after the other guy's castle. Now, if that's the case, you want a castle with a big motor around it. There's a lot of ways you can have a motor on something. You could have it by patent protection. You could have it by location in certain certain areas. I mean, uh, if you own, if you have something in people's mind, like Coca-Cola, six billion people in the world, practically all of them have something in their mind about Coca-Cola, largely favorable. They're going to sell a lot of Coca-Cola. And it won't make any difference if somebody is a half a cent less of a conservative than Coke. So that's an enduring competitive advantage. And you want it run by honest and able people. You don't want to go in with a crook, and you don't want to go in with a dope. Now, the best businesses to buy are the ones where you could have a dope in there. I mean, Peter Lynch says, you know, buy a business that's so good that an idiot can run it because sooner or later one will. You know, and, and there's some merit for that. You know, at, uh, uh, at those are the kind of businesses to own. So you want, but you want a management that's able and honest, and then you want a price that's sensible, and that's what you'd look for. You'd go around Tennessee, got a week to do it. And you'd immediately screen out a whole bunch of things. You just know that they weren't a fertile area. You know? And th that's an important thing to be able to do, to know, to get rid of all kinds of things. There was a great article in the New Yorker 30 years ago when Bobby Fischer was playing Spassky in, 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 in the famous <coughs> match, which drew attention around the world. And they examined how the mind could, with billions and billions and billions of possibilities, how it could group things so it was immediately cast it down to where you had like four options. And of course, when the, when the, when the humans play something like Deep Thought, you know, or whatever the latest version is of the computer on that, that computer is making maybe 700,000 or a million calculations a second. And the human mind is competing against that, but the computer is checking every possibility. And the human mind somehow has this ability to cast out 99.999% of those things that the computer has to go through in order to focus on the three or four possibilities that really make sense. And investing is a lot like that. It's not that tough because there aren't that many companies. But the, you want to cast out all kinds of things. If somebody told me that my life depended on picking among the Dow Jones stocks a group of 10 that would be the best performers or, 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 or outperform the index as a whole, I would spend my time thinking of the worst companies in there. I would cast out things, and then I would figure I left those behind. And I would, I would, that's an easier way to approach the problem. 
actually, than, than, than trying to pick the 10 best. Uh, so you would have to, you were thinking about the state of Tennessee, you know, there's a whole lot of things you wouldn't examine. You just figure they're too tough. You might decide, you know, car dealerships were too tough. It's always going to be competitive. Who knows whether Ford or General Motors are going to be selling more cars five years from now or whether there's going to be tariffs on foreign cars. Who knows? So you just say, I'll give up on car dealers. Uh, that approach uh, that you use there is the same approach you really want to bring to the stock market. You've got 3,000 companies tonight you can look at on the New York Stock Exchange. You don't have to play. Once a year, if you have twenty good, or if you have five good ideas in your lifetime, you get very rich. Third thing in Graham's book is the margin of safety. If you come up to a bridge and it says capacity ten thousand pounds, and you're driving a ninety-eight hundred pound truck, you drive down further and find another bridge. I mean, you know, they nobody knows exactly what it was. If you wait till something kind of shouts at you, it's not. If I get an idea about looking up a company, and I get the 10Ks and so on. I would rather not know the price, because I'd rather value it without knowing the price. A stock is part of a business. You value a business, and then you divide by the shares outstanding. But what you have to think about is what kind of a business are you getting into, what are its economic characteristics, who are its competitors, what's its management like, all of these things that relate to a business instead of a little trigger symbol. And you can build all kinds of, all kinds of structures on that. But that's the foundation. And if you've got that in mind, and that's in the intelligent investor, I've never found anything that remotely compares with it. We have to deal in things that we're capable of understanding. And then, once we're over that filter, we have to have a business with some intrinsic characteristics that give it a durable competitive advantage and then of course we would vastly prefer a management in place with a lot of integrity and talent and finally no matter how wonderful it is it's not worth an infinite price so we have to have a price that makes sense and gives a margin of safety considering the natural vicissitudes of life it's a very simple set of ideas. And the reason that our ideas have not spread faster is they're too simple. <laughs>